James, we're ready to start when you are. Uh, James here. This is James Oberly speaking, um, Department of History, University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, Emeritus faculty and Fulbrighter to Hungary in 2013, hopeful Fulbrighter to the Slovak Republic in 2023. But we're here for the Fulbright Association Conference. Delighted to welcome so many participants. We have a full group today and we have a full panel and you wanna hear from them. So you're attending <laughs> session nine. Our session title is the Fulbright Award, Impact, Benefits and Ethical Implications. Let me list the names of our speakers and their topics. And what we're gonna do is hear from them in the order that they're listed in the program. And then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. I know it's been a long three days of convention airing on Zoom, but we've got a good session for you. Okay, starting us off uh, with the Fulbright Oaxaca cluster, Synergy and Multiplier Effects, Dr. Jack Corbett, Portland State University. And I have to mention Dr. Corbett, I'm the proud father of a Portland State University graduate in mathematics, two degrees from PSU. And accompanying Dr. Corbett is uh, Ms. Maddie Elder and Ms. Nadia Mata Sanchez, and they're on the screen here with us. Next up, we're gonna hear from Mr. Jeff uh, Kelly Lowenstein from Grand Valley State University. He's gonna be talking about the ingredients of a lifelong Fulbright friendship and its implications for the program. Then we'll turn to Dr. Charlotte McDaniel, Emory University, the Center for the Study of Law and Religion. She's going to talk to us about ethics and documentary work, Fulbright appointments. Finally, Dr. McDaniel, we're gonna hear from Dr. Daphne Natiri from Wayne State University in Detroit. She's, uh, her title of her talk will be The Paradox of Scant, Taking the Proactive Leap as a Fulbrighter. And Dr. Natiri will be fourth on our panel. And then Dr. Juanita Viena Alvarez from the University of South Carolina Buford will finish up our speakers list. She's going to be speaking on the topic, Fulbright Global Local Impact from Fulbright Experience to Local Community Lectures. Okay, by now, three days into the conference, we're pretty experienced with the Q&A and the chat. I ask you to use the, the um, chat to introduce yourself and maybe your Fulbright Award, where you're coming from, contact information if you'd like. And let's use the Q&A for specific questions, comments, and observations about what our five uh, presenters have to say. So let's, uh, let's get going. First up is Dr. Corbett and his team from Portland State, the Fulbright Oaxaca Cluster, Dr. Corbett. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, James. Historically, discussions of Fulbrights abroad or in the United States have centered on recruitment, engagement, and support of individuals committed to international understanding. This emphasis on the individual leads us to overlook the benefits of collaboration and mutual support in pursuit of our shared ideals. In keeping with our focus on collective action, this presentation on the Fulbright Oaxaca Cluster draws from Dr. Annabel Lopez Salinas of the University of British Columbia in Kelowna, Canada, Ramona Perez of San Diego State University, California, Arthur Murphy of University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Nidia Mata Sanchez, President or Rectora of the Technological University of the Central Valleys of Oaxaca. Mandy Elder, the Ford Founda Family Foundation, Roseburg, Oregon, and myself. Nidia and Mandy will address examples of the cluster's activities and accomplishments in a specific setting. So, Mandy and Nidia, it's over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Um, our colleague Nidia is here, though you cannot see her video. She is connected and she will also be speaking after me. If somebody can help her out with her video, that would be great. Thank you. Um, um, my name is Mandy Elder. I currently work at the Ford Family Foundation in Roseburg, Oregon, in rural Southern Oregon. Um, I was a Fulbright Garcia Robles recipient to Mexico in 2012. Um, and really, I just wanna say it's an honor to get to represent in this panel, just a piece of the many years and decades of work that has happened in Fulbright and Oaxaca through Fulbright, especially through Dr. Jack Corbett's extensive network over the years. Um, I've been working closely with Dr. Corbett as well as Nidia since um, 2012 when I had my Fulbright to Oaxaca. And 
So this example is how through our work together, we've expanded the impact of what initially was one or two Fulbright awards to encompass much more cross-border learning, especially in support of young women who, uh, young women in Mexico who ordinarily would not be eligible for a Fulbright experience like this. And these opportunities for them in essence have um, been created sort of on the back of a Fulbright award. Um, I started learning and working in uh, Oaxaca in 2009, and this was thanks to Jack's extensive network. He um, had been collaborating with colleagues there um, since his first Fulbright Award years ago in Oaxaca, and um, I participated in a community-based course um, there um, as an undergraduate that went with different organization and community leaders, nonprofits, academics, and universities. And after meeting Nydia, our work began to develop more um, in support of rural women's higher education access. Uh, Nydia at the time was the outreach director of what was a new university and student supports that help young women from rural areas um, to be able to support their retention in higher education and um, to address some of the sociocultural factors that um, women from very rural communities um, that might be barriers to them to completing their education. And uh, so we created something called the University Center for Women's Leadership. It's known as Same Mujer in Oaxaca. And we developed curriculum and supports that could wrap around them. And uh, uh, one of the goals of the university at the time was to promote more international education opportunities for students. So we connected this with Same Mujer and began facilitating international courses. Um, we so we actually brought groups of young women from Oaxaca to Oregon and to Portland State to, to have their own community based learning experiences and some of those experiences evolved into longer um, hands on learning and internship opportunities that are much more akin to a Fulbright experience in some ways. Um, and. Uh, the, the university under Nydia's leadership has been able to expand international learning um, to Europe, South America, you know, it's far beyond Oregon, certainly. And, but this, this same idea of individual growth through international experiences that sort of underpins that those programs really stems from uh, Fulbright. And the idea that this cross-border learning goes both ways. Um, we all learn together. And so um, I'm going to play um, a video in the background. It does not have sound, a slideshow, as Nydia presents. Thank you, Mandy. I had some problems with my video, but I think the presentation could help to describe what we are talking about. Good afternoon, my name is Nidia Mata. I am currently serving as president of the Technological University of the Central Valleys in Oaxaca. For more than 15 years, I have had a direct and enriching connection with Will Fulbright grantees who have helped me to establish collaborative networks and strategic projects that contribute to important educational initiatives in Oaxaca and throughout Mexico. However, the most important programs that I have worked on have been with Jack Corbett and Mandy Elder. One of our favorite programs that continues to grow in the university is the University Center for Women's Leadership. The following slides will show how collaboration with women in universities has created a large network of professional women offering support to one another. The development of leadership capacities, a focus on productive projects, and aspiring constantly toward leadership position and postgraduate studies are important characteristics of Se Mujer. Through the consistent support, advice, and collaborative networks of our colleagues Jack and Mandy, we have been able to sustain this program and extend it to other states within Mexico.
The impact of Fulbright grants affect not only those who receive them or their home communities and workplaces, but the people they meet in their new communities, the people they inspire and motivate, and in turn those who become part of a change of partners. We see the forum enduring friendships and together promote change. All of Oaxaca benefits from these relations. As you can see in the photos, Semuher today demonstrates on a national level the importance of empowering women to access better professional opportunities, to work with confidence, to learn about themselves, to develop a global and community level vision, and most importantly, to be an independent woman who is able to reach success by building her own personal ideals and goals. For more information, the presentation contains our contacts and social media accounts. Thank you. Dr. Corbett, you're muted, so you want to turn your microphone back on. There you go. In engagement with the multiple initiatives of Say Muhair and the UTE are but an example of the Fulbright Oaxaca cluster. We've had more than 2,000 participants in North South exchange programs, worked with universities, research centers nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and other facets of civic life there. So we thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Corbett. I think we just got cut off for a sec there, but I wanna yeah, thank- that, that was, sorry about that. That was because the, sh the screens shifted unexpectedly. So no worries, sorry about that, Jack. If you wanna finish your sentence, that, that was a technical problem on my end. No, no problem. No problem. We're done. We want to thank you very much for your interest. And I want to thank the Fulbright Oaxaca cluster. That was wonderful, Dr. Corbett, um, Ms. Elder, and President Rector Mata Sanchez said, I think President Mata Sanchez used the word inspire. That was an inspirational presentation. Wonderful. So thank you very much. Okay, let's go on to our second presenter, and um, that will be Jeff Kelly Lowenstein from Grand Valley State University in Michigan. He's with the Center for Collaborative and Investigative Journalism. And um, Jeff, if you would turn on your screen, and I think you have some photos to show, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jack, and uh, thank you so uh, thank you so much to. Uh, the colleagues on the panel, uh, Manir and all those involved in the Fulbright Conference for their hard work in the we'll hear from in a minute. Uh, my central point in this part of the presentation is that being part of the Fulbright community the past 26 years has been a process of initially converting a long held dream into reality. And that experience has led to a series of global friendships benefits and impact that have in turn have expanded my sense of possibility and sparked other dreams. So the origin for me, I went to Stanford as an undergraduate in the 1980s. While there, I learned about the South African freedom struggle, joined the divestment movement and hatched a dream of one day going to the country. That dream came true in 1995 when I was accepted to participate in the Fulbright Teacher Exchange Program. It was a transformative experience. It came during a heady time in the country Nelson Mandela had recently been elected president. South Africa had won the Rugby World Cup and Archbishop Desmond Tutu was leading the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I had many remarkable experiences. I traveled to the Cape of Good Hope, standing at the point where the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans converged, something I had taught about many times while teaching European expansion was profoundly moving. I taught and coached at one of the country's first private multiracial schools. I taught and attended, I'm sorry, I attended the first day of hearings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in KwaZulu-Natal, and now connecting to the panel's theme, Vukani had instructed his friends to take me in as a brother. And they did just that. We played and watched soccer. They took me to the townships and the oceanfront divide. Three friends got married during that year, each of which was special for its own reason. Vukani had a very powerful experience. We were in good touch. 
but we weren't actually in the same place at the same time, except during the orientation. Now afterward, Vukani will talk more about this, and I just want to acknowledge his tremendous generosity, organizational skill, sensitivity, and the concept that he introduced of making history together. And this is a very powerful concept because it incorporates the past and the present as it looks toward the future. And he did this as I came back to South Africa in 2011 to cover the International Climate Change Conference and starting in 2015 to 2019, about twice a year. And he'll elaborate on this, but this period is where the transition that had already occurred from our initial relationship really grew deeper into a lifelong friendship, true brotherhood, and the kind of intercultural exchange that is the essence of the program. So I'll just screen share uh, for just a minute here. Thank you so much for your patience. There we go. And we'll go here. So here is an image from 2011. Uh, Vukani organized for us to go to the soccer game. This is the Orlando Pirates, his favorite team at Moses Mabita Stadium. Uh, so just a tremendous experience there while I was there for the climate change conference. And then the other image I wanted to show, this is from 2016, and we are flanking a former student and player on the soccer team. And so I specifically chose to show this on Vukani's Facebook page because you can see Mangoba saying, my high school English teachers and soccer coaches. And this is on the day that he, in fact, made history because he became the first uh, black African member of the ANC, African National Congress, to win a local or uh, provincial election uh, at the Central Business District of Peter Marisburg. So this was during election day. So I just wanted to share those two images. Now, uh, in terms of moving forward, uh, in terms of benefits, impact, and ethical implications, I guess I would just close by saying that for me, they extend beyond the direct experience of the Fulbright. Thanks to Fulbright, I'm part of a circle of, of a brother and with Vukani and lifelong friends who I know to whom we'll be connected for as long as we're all alive. They have a very strong sense of interconnectedness that I've learned from and that has deep ethical implications. Uh, the Fulbright year helped me deal well in other situations where I've been the only member of an outsider group. I worked for several years at the, Chicago, at the Spanish language newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, where I was the only non-Latino staff member and my Fulbright year helped me understand how to navigate this, linguistical, this linguistic, cultural, and professional terrain. And then finally, the lessons from our friendship I've applied in my work. So how I handled the money with the core team of a nonprofit I started came from my memory of what Vukani told me about how his parents dealt with money when he was a child. They would gather the family around the table, say, put the money on the table, say, this is what we have. Here's what each person, each person needs. Here's what each person will get. And so that sense of radical transparency, bone dean commitment to family, and of working to meet everyone's needs have all been guides for me. Now, 26 years ago yesterday, I turned 30 years old while in South Africa. Today, more than a quarter century later, I can't express how meaningful it is for me to be with Vukani and all of you as we talk about our friendship, the Fulbright program, and what it's contributed to all our lives. And so with that, I'll turn to Vukani, who will take the second portion of our presentation. Thank you so much. Vukani, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I, I, I'm very happy to be part of this, um, I think, historic uh, gathering. And my presentation really is um, entitled 26 Years Strong and Into the Future. And um, it is, um, I'd like to move on to the next screen, please. It all started at Utongati, KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. And by the way, it's going for midnight in South Africa as we speak. So <laughs> I'm, I was really looking forward to this. I, 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 first of all, I want to talk to um, the, um, the potential that um, was recognized by Miss Millie Reddy, um, my mentor at Utongati back then, 26 years ago, who made me realize that I could uh, succeed with the Fulbright program application. Next screen, please. And um, 
once that was done, uh, I found myself at Washington DC at the American University for orientation. And um, that memory of meeting Jeffrey Lowenstein for the very first time in my life uh, is still etched in my memory. It, it, and it is the first milestone in the shaping of our relationship. Um, and little did we know that 26 years later we'd still be brothers. Uh, next screen, please. So what was the first thing that was full of impact for me was the immersion um, of not just myself and everybody else who was part of that team of okay. 1995, uh, the impact of coming face to face with everything I had seen and okay. read in books and movies and the sheer magnitude uh, of the Washington DC complex and the Smithsonian, uh, Smithsonian Institution. Um, the major okay. highlights um, were, you know, um, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And at the time, didn't know that I'd come back at a later stage. The Capitol, the Lincoln Memorial, and the National Mall. And all of these things, and you must look at it from a perspective of a, a young teacher from South Africa who's seeing all of these things uh, in one week and the impact of, of it all. Uh, next screen, please. So, that uh, immersion in American culture and all these iconic um, buildings and institutions in, 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 in Washington, DC. And then the following week, I'm in Boston, Charles E. Brown Middle School. I meet Jeff's family, faculty members and friends. And of course, I, the first time I felt very silly was when I experienced the Indian summer, something I'd never experienced in my entire life. But it was the awakening to possibilities, uh, growth and self-discovery. And um, the expression of professionalism through South African content that became part of the elective subjects that I taught at Brown because we were, um, as teachers, required to put together our own um, subjects and, and, and prepare for the next term. So I pay tribute to the collective support of uh, the faculty at Brown Middle School. It was collegial and warm. It taught me inclusivity and a perspective uh, on the value of democracy. So the highlight really, um, the highlight for me for the exchange was uh, to take place in March of 1996, when um, the Fulbright program recognized and honored me and uh, I was um, uh, selected, appointed, awarded, and I uh, found myself uh, having dinner at the White House and met uh, President Bill and Hillary Clinton. And it was a singular honor that really kept uh, my uh, year and tenure at uh, uh, the Fulbright program. So what's common between Jeff and I? We have um, aging parents. We um, believe in honest engagement. We are passionate about productive application with other human beings because that's where we find value. We're both tenacious and we love life. And um, we, that's, that's, I think, the foundational uh, commonalities that led us to talking about making history together. And what is it that it is that's making history together. It's about the acknowledgement of milestones and experiences that we've shared together. And especially because Jeff made return visits. Um, I'll mention these particular townships. I took Jeff, apart from the fact that my friends had done this for him, but I did this without the tourist buyers, Wamash, Tuzuma, Inanda, and Umlaz. And there's a huge townships which bear historical value and um, especially because of our political table in history. So <clears throat> this was very important in terms of Jeff and I doing it together. And then of course it continues when Jeff arrives, we started having what we now call a standing ritual. We go to the same eatery in the heart of Durban, which is uh, the big coastal city in Guadalupe Natal. I visited Jeff when he was a, a visiting professor at Wits University. COP17, we went back together to Utongati, where I used to teach and where he came and taught some of my students. You've seen the picture of Mangoba, who was the captain of the football team that Jeff took over. Jeff, nine, nine, nine years ago, he wrote a blog about my mother turning 80. She's 89 now. 
So in less than three months, she'll be 90. That was a serious history that um, was very uh, impactful in my life and my family. And what's the critical impact? Um, and that's how I want to conclude. All these collective experiences and moments have a cumulative effect. Um, it has enriched our lives both when we were single and now as married men, we've formed life lifelong bonds. Uh, he's brought his wife to South Africa, to my house, spent time with my kids and my wife and other friends. Uh, what the Fulbright uh, exchange did for me, I came back to South Africa, completed the portion that I needed to, and then went back to study because that the impact, I felt that I needed to study further and I went and studied. And then after that, I went into business. So I work as a business person in the business of media um, and I, I, I thrive in giving other people uh, empowerment through employment. So the impact of the Fulbright program exchange, it's beyond the realm of professionalism and into the cross-cultural exploration of humanity. Thank you, Gyabonga. Gyabonga is Zulu for thank you. And thank you for teaching us that, um, both of you, Jeff Kelly Lowenstein and Rukhani Sele, wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you for staying up late in South Africa. It's out there. And um, we, that was wonderful. Okay, um, let's turn next. And before I we turn to our next speaker, just remind our participants, we have about 50 or so people on the Zoom um, webinar here. Please feel free to put questions, comments, observations in the Q&A, if you would. And we'll make sure to take those at the end when we've heard from all of our speakers. Okay, delighted to introduce our third presenter, Dr. Charlotte McDaniel, Center for Law, Study of Law and Religion at Emory University. She's going to speak to us about ethics and documentary work Fulbright appointments. Dr. McDaniel. Thank you, Jim, and thank you so much for your willingness to do this. Um, good evening. It's truly an honor to be able to offer a presentation for the second virtual Fulbright conference and to address what I consider something of an appetizer, a starter for what I hope may become a more substantial conversation in the future, especially because I'd love to have my co-presenter, Professor Joe Vitone, join me. He's unable to be here tonight. So I look forward to that possibility. And in order to try to stay within the required 10 minutes, I'm going to more or less uh, stick to some notes that I've made. <clears throat> so I wanna start by drawing attention to the manner in which we as Fulbrights, whether we're scholars on teacher exchange or students, engage our visits as guests in a host country. More importantly, however, for tonight, I want to focus our activities on the return that we have from our appointments. My main aim is to draw attention to our responsibility, not only as a Fulbright on appointment and how we represent the United States to others, but an interactive, interrelated responsibility. How do we represent our host countries and those many citizens when we return? For instance, <clears throat> our reports and especially our images, our presentations, are more than a statement. Indeed, they may become a story, a narrative, which interprets the situation. For that reason, I hope we can consider the ethical responsibility we have as we return from these wonderful, interesting learning situations that we call Fulbright. I think we have a responsibility as we also represent that host country. We also interpret them. Thus, as we conclude and return from our appointments, I encourage each of us to think about several dimensions. How can we responsibly and ethically represent those countries and their many citizens to others? As a basis for this appetizer conversation, um, I'm gonna to refer to two resources. One is the fundamental tenet of ethics. Or it's, a, it's one of the principles of ethics, and that is to always treat others with respect. Put another way, ask ourselves if it's fair and a just presentation, or even a good interpretation. We all have biases, biases that are informed by our socioeconomic situation, our prior experience, our backgrounds, our education, for example. However, regardless of that, all persons need to be treated with respect and fairly. That fundamental tenet would also apply to the country per se, but perhaps more readily to the many persons that are residing in those countries. 
This is the important mirror side of the Fulbright appointment that we engage in. Respect is a fundamental premise for our visits. So afterwards, as Fulbrights, we need to think about returning as a guest from a host country. <clears throat> Secondly, I also refer to the seminal work of Robert Coles, whom I had the privilege of meeting in my very early career. As author of the very well-known and off-cited book, Doing Documentary Work, Coles claims that images, think here, pictures, the many selfies we take, those photos and slides, depict the situation. Images are central. They convey important information and they leave a lasting impression on the viewer. Thus, if we want to accurately and ethically convey our work, the place where we worked while on that wonderful experience, we need to give serious consideration to that situation once we're home. And not just as we're working on site, but as we talk to others, offer presentations that include our colleagues, but also family and friends. A fundamental question could be, is the situation that we depict accurate? Does it show a bias? And if so, what is that bias? In terms of ethics, I would ask, is what you, I, we are presenting doing justice to that situation, to the country, to its wonderful people? Another way to put it is to ask ourselves, is that a fair depiction? As I alluded to earlier, we too, look through lens that are biased. All of us have it, including me, of course. Thus, if it's not fair, maybe I could suggest that we just adjust it, revise it, rethink, delete a picture. <clears throat> My concern is that we may offer a picture, if you will, that is two-pronged. One, it's really hard and rarely do we see the entire of the whole country, much less all of its people. So secondly, what we present may not be entirely accurate. It may depict a small slice of the pie, as it were. It comes then a potentially biased picture. It is understandable that it would be really hard to try to convey an entire country. Like the visitors who come to the United States and tell us when they've been to New York, I've been to the US and we know there's a lot more to be seen. However, what we as Fulbrights present may become the only picture of our host country that others know. Our depiction may be there, or our viewers take away, and we know that images are lasting. So allow me two examples that will help to convey this perhaps more pointedly. One of my colleagues, whose parents immigrated here from Pakistan, happened to be viewing one such presentation, including pictures, by someone who showed only extremely poor and very underserved citizens in Pakistan, including shots of sewage and other items. I won't go on. He was distressed that this depiction or this image did not fully grasp some of the newer and more modern aspects of his country as well. He felt it was unfair, unjust, he said. He was angry. Second, in my own Fulbright appointments, and I've been very fortunate to have four, I've experienced somewhat of a range of development across those countries, but also within them. To put a finer point on this, because of my um, work in biomedical ethics, I typically am appointed to an academic health science center where I've done needs assessments, curricular revision, offered workshops, lectured, taught courses, done research and presented on it. Regardless though, whatever those activities are, they typically have occurred in a medical center. And while that's been fabulous and I've loved it, what's important to consider here is the personnel, for example, physicians, nurses, chaplains, other care workers, they're considered professionals. As professionals, they may have a different level of education than others across the country at large. Also, the very buildings of a health center may be different they may be more substantial than some of the other buildings across the country. So there's a potential difference between what one might see in a medical center in contrast to local homes that we visit or the people as a whole. It's important that I, as the presenter, for example, let my viewers know so we can draw attention to these distinctions, ones that might otherwise go unspoken or unnoted 
as was the case with my colleague from Pakistan. So thinking back on Cole's work, it led me to ask or to think about what can we as Fulbrights do to avoid, to avoid bias, even potential error in our future presentations? How can we remain responsible and ethical Fulbrights and address these challenges? So I'm gonna conclude with a couple of questions to mull over and suggestions to consider. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's some ideas to think about. Number one, be honest and transparent about your appointment. If it's targeted to one part of the world or one part of the population, note that. And note that it may not be representative. Two, be reflective of yourself before you go and after you come back. What biases do you take with you and how might they affect your presentations, much less your activities there? What's your own background or education? Is it different or similar to where you're working? Three, ask yourself about the images you're showing. Is it a full depiction? Is it fair? Is it just? And if not, I suggest the delete button. Four, think about the images you did not show, the stories you did not tell. Do these represent a bias? Five, as you ask about your pictures or reports, you might also consider some relevant statistics. For example, that could help make comparisons more distinct and help provide a fuller, more accurate picture of that country. <clears throat> Six, Coles also noted that it's not just the images per se, but the way in which they're arranged. He used to ask questions about why are you putting this one first and why is that one last? And are there selection biases that you're not acknowledging? And seven, lastly, perhaps more importantly, can you honestly say that all your images are respectful of the country and its citizens? Equally important, and this is very important for me in terms of ethics, did you consider asking permission to take those pictures? And if not, why not? Permission is a form of respect. So all of these matters do, do all of these issues, excuse me, do matter. So thus in concluding, while most Fulbrights are not documentarians, we can certainly learn from documentary studies as well as underlying ethical parameters. In order to be responsible and continue ethical presentations, when we return from these amazing experiences that we call Fulbright appointments, Thank you so very much for your attention. And let me just comment that I won't be able to remain for the entire Q&A, but for the first part. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. McDaniel. And um, again, encourage our participants in the audience to put questions in the Q&A. Dr. McDaniel, if there's some late questions that come in, I'll write them down and, and send them on to you and ask, expect you to answer them. So, so thanks so much. And uh, boy, you have challenged us and given us lots to think about. Um, we're going to hear from Dr. Daphne Natiri next, but I just want to say that our fifth presenter is going to circle back to some of the themes that you mentioned, Dr. McDaniel. Dr. Vienna Alvarez is going to talk about again when you come back from your appointment about sharing your experiences. So thanks, Dr. McDaniel. Okay, our fourth speaker, delighted to introduce from Wayne State University, Dr. Daphne Natiri. Uh, Dr. Natiri will be talking about the paradox of scant, provocative title taking the proactive leap as a Fulbrighter. Dr. Natiri, the floor is yours. And Dr. Natiri, so if you would turn off your mute button and turn on your microphone button, and then also turn on your share video, we could see you and we could hear you. There you are. Welcome, Dr. Nateri. Now, if you would turn on your microphone. Let's see if I can do it from here. I don't think I have the controls. Maybe John Bader can, or maybe Munir behind the screens can do it. So Dr. Nateri, at the bottom left on your screen, there should be an icon of a microphone. If you unclick that strike through, you'll be able to speak. That's right. Thank you. You're on. Thank you. All We're right. looking forward to hearing from you. All right. Good. Um, take this picture off.
I'm sorry, I, I don't know why I have two pictures here, but uh, no. Okay, so um, sorry about that, but uh, I really want to thank you. Can you see me now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can see loud and clear, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Nasiri. All right, then. I'm just wondering about my presentation. Where is it? Okay, that's good. Okay. So, Dr. Terry, at the bottom, if you click on the share screen, it should be highlighted in green, and then you should be able to go from there. Yeah, all right. Let's just share screen. And um, share my screen. Okay. Just a minute. I'm, I'm almost there. That's okay. We can do this all the time. I don't know. <laughs> Share my screen. We are three days into our conference now, and we we learn patience. Desktop. Oh God. Uh, wait a minute. What am I doing? I have my screen right here, and uh, let's click on on the. Click on um, share. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, open system. Okay. Can you can you see me now? We can see you and hear you, Doctor Nahiri, but we can't see your screen. So um, sometimes it takes a second or two to click in. Try make sure that share screen is clicked at the bottom, and then there should be a. It should come up. Okay, I'm scared. Share the screen. There's something else I said share, so it should come up. Oh, wait. Share. It says open system preferences. Okay. Allow. Uh, well, anyway, let me get started. Yeah, um, just talk to us. That would be fine. Yeah, I, I can. Um, I, I can. I want to thank everybody for having me here today. It has been a wonderful opportunity listening and learning from the wider range of presenters from around the globe. Mm -hmm. I do need to get this thing here, so I am just wondering how what I'm doing that's wrong. Uh, so, Dr. Natiri, we have some staff behind the screens. Alicia from the um, Fulbright Association is going to try and help. But go ahead, talk to us, okay? Okay. Just, All right. Yeah. We're here to talk. Okay. So my 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 Presentation is on is a full, is a PowerPoint. It's been a wonderful opportunity actually listening and, and learning from the wide array of uh, speakers and presenters from around uh, the globe, um, distilling lessons of hope and engendering growth through knowledge and experiences. So um, I am a distinguished service professor from Wayne State University. I teach in the African American Studies Department in Det in, in Detroit. And I was assigned as a Fulbright scholar to the University of Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, West Africa. I have all of that. Can I, can I do that now? Can I see the screen right now? Is the screen available to be seen? I don't see anybody else. Hi, oh. we're here. Um, if, you, if you see the, the green share screen button, just click on it. And once okay. you click on the button, it'll open up and you'll be able to choose from your various presentations or screens that you have up. Do you see that? Um, I see the desk, desktop, whiteboard, iPhone, iPhone pad, um, Google Chrome unknown. I see share, I, I click share. Exactly, do you have your presentation up on your screen? On my desktop it is. Okay, so open that up. And then when you click share, you should be able to click on that. What you can do as well, um, you can email me your, your presentation really quickly and I can share my screen for you. Oh, fantastic. Okay, let me do that because um, I, I, I took some time to prepare this and <laughs> I'll be very upset if I don't have the chance to see it. Let me, let, me, let me just send it to you right now. Who am I sending it to? So send it to Alicia, A-L-I-C-I-A -I -I -A okay. at fullbright.org. Coming up right now. Is there someone I can go next and then we'll come back to you? Dr. Natiri, would that be okay if we went to Dr. Um, Vienna Alvarez and heard from her and then come back to you? Dr. Al oh, Vienna oh, Alvarez, oh, would that be okay if you if we change the order? Okay, oh, that's fine. Okay, so Dr. Uh, Natiri, if you would mute yourself now oh, and okay. we'll, we'll, we'll turn to Dr. Uh, Juanita uh, Vienna Alvarez She's going to speak to, she's from University of South Carolina, Buford. She's going to speak to us on the topic, 
Fulbright global local impact from Fulbright experience to local community lectures. I think it follows, I think Dr. Vienna Alvarez, your, your talk is gonna follow very nicely what Dr. McDaniel was talking about. So um, Dr. <laughs> Vienna Alvarez, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Can you all hear me? We can hear you, we can see it. Your screen is up and working. Take it okay, away. Wonderful. Thank you very much to everyone. And um, I want to say good afternoon, good evening, good morning, because we're all over the world. Uh, a little side note about my background. I was born in Asia. I was educated in Europe and now I'm an American citizen, Fulbrighty, and as well a Rotary um, Ambassador of Goodwill Scholar. I've been at my university for 27 years. That's something about loyalty there and also I truly believe that change is a norm for all of us and that we should always, we must continuously evolve. And that's one important thing. So I'm gonna go real quick regarding the uh, first part here because this is just the background information from the American Association of uh, State Colleges and Universities on the importance of community awareness and as well from a publication as um, impact of uh, Fulbright, the importance of bringing universities to local communities and the quadruple helix model. Quadruple helix meaning involving universities with public sector, with business and civil society. And the reason I point this out is we all are aware that there is a prevalence of fake news happening right now, whether it's fake news regarding immigration or fake news regarding um, climate change or the environment and all that. And as Fulbrighters, we have a role to dispel some of this fake news. And so quickly, before I continue with the community part, many of you may not be aware of what a Fulbright Haze is. And so when I got the Fulbright Haze in 2018, it was with 15 other American professors and it was really quick, really fast, 30 days, 45 lectures and presentations, seven modes of transportation that included the plane, the train, the Uber, the subway, nine different hotels, 10 different cities, five different palaces, 12 different museums. And in Poland, where I did my Fulbright Auschwitz and countless meal discussions with the local community in Poland, as well as the American professors. To give you an idea, here's an image. Oh, actually a group of images plus the map of Poland where you can see all the different cities that we visited within the 30 days of the Fulbright Haze. Now, very quickly again, because I want uh, Professor Ntiri to have enough time, the Fulbright goal versus the Fulbright Association goal is all about sharing and uh, global education and all that, but nowhere in this goal does it point out that we must limit it in academia. Hence, my perspective is to bring it outside academia into the community, which is exactly what I did. Seven months after my Fulbright case in Poland, I did a presentation in my community here in South Carolina, and it's about 30 years after the Berlin Wall, where was Poland now? And lo and behold, the audience that we had, we had standing room only, we needed to bring folding chairs because there were so many people interested in the topic. And from the pictures that I'm showing now, you can see how very engaged, how much of the attendees were so eager to participate in the Fulbright topic that I was presenting to them. Now, going full circle, seven days after that local presentation in South Carolina, I was invited to do a presentation in Poland. So I again brought the topic of my Fulbright and my lecture in South Carolina back to Poland with the local community in Poland to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Fulbright Poland with a keynote speech and introduced by the ambassador there. And following day, I was asked to talk not only to the Fulbrighters, but also to NAWA. NAWA is the international education part of the government of Poland. Um, similar to our uh, Department of Education, but focusing more on internationals. Now, you can see the image in the PowerPoint I was showing here. I was trying to connect the local community that I presented the Fulbright on to the local community back in Poland. So it's like a full circle. And the importance of this is, again, to get the messages out, not only within academia, not only within university students, but as well to the community. and. 
just to give an example of the community I was talking about, that presentation that was through the Osher Lifelong Learning in South Carolina, uh, one neighborhood, and you can see the orange box there of what the neighborhood represents. This neighborhood called Sun City Hilton Head has about 20,000 residents. And with this residents, we really need to, as Fulbrighters, continue the communication again to dispel this um, fake news that seems to be abounding everywhere. As Fulbrighters, we show images, we show activities that we did, and this cannot be considered fake news, whether it's regarding immigration or whether it's regarding Haiti, or which by the way, I watched the presentation yesterday, very interesting on Haiti at the Fulbright Conference and on the immigration happening in Mexico. So it is this types of presentations that we need to bring to the community that will show them, that will dispel or uh, take away some of the aspects of the fake news that's circulating. When uh, I finished the presentation in South Carolina regarding the uh, Fulbright, there were already several members of the audience talking about how they were planning to visit Poland, how they wanted their grandchildren or their children to go do study abroad in Poland. So the value of the Fulbright impact to the community in the current social and political climate in the United States, and not just in the United States, in the whole world, there is much need for a stronger global view that is shared beyond the campus. Because our global perspectives as Fulbrighters are important, but also beyond academia. And when I say beyond academia, not just the golden age in these pictures that you saw earlier, but visits and speaking to K through 12. The earlier the grade level, the better, because they're still open, they're still willing to accept the information where uh, we can provide to them. Also, visit and present at local civic and service organizations, the Rotary, the Lions, the Kiwanis, not just staying in academia, but really going out there in the community. And uh, if I can backtrack, share the materials, share the knowledge. So when I got the Fulbright Hayes in 2018, I was able to share this with another faculty here, Dr. James. He then was successful in his bid for a Fulbright Hayes in Mexico. And now he himself is sharing. So this multiplication effect that we have as Fulbrighters. So from 2018 Fulbright Poland that I did, 2019, we became a top producer for faculty and staff. And for the first time ever, 2020, with my office's assistance, we got our very first Fulbright student recipient of all places to Spain, a very competitive location. So again, the message here is to share the Fulbright access to multiply the reach of our Fulbright. And very quickly, uh, you can see the chart on the left side of the page there uh, for a Fulbrighter. For 12 months, 75% of Fulbright Scholar alumni, we are able to teach about 122 students through an average of about four classes. And that means that all the Fulbrighters can reach up to 278,000 students through 10,000 classes. And the numbers below talk to multiplying this coming up to about 2 million. But we can convert that 2 million to even 10 million lives that we can affect by me calling on all Fulbrighters to please consider presenting in the community to K through 12, because K through 12, these children, we can still shape their way of thinking. We can bring our Fulbright knowledge outside of academia where we can sway the way of thinking. Remember, citizens, they vote. And when they vote, we can have a way of affecting that vote if we could just spread the news. So Fulbright's investment in us then becomes a lifelong investment. So I rushed this. I am so sorry if it was going so fast. I'm going to stop share. But I wanted Professor Natiri to have enough time. Dr. Oberly, how was that? Was that too fast? That was wonderful. Dr. Uh, Jim, 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 a quick, Jim, a quick interruption. Uh, yes. Juanita, you should know that the Fulbright Association sponsors community outreach the very way you're describing through our Fulbright in the Classroom uh, project. So please visit our website under programs and look up Fulbright in the Classroom and please get involved. 
So yes, thank I you, Jim. Will. Thank you, Juanita. Thank okay. you. Okay, and I was going to say, um, Dr. Vienna Alvarez, we have some friends who spend their winter in Buford every, and I bet they're among those 20,000. You happen to live in a place that's become a significant uh, magnet for retirees from colder climates, and they are hungry for intellectual stimulation. They are lifelong learners, and I can well imagine your talk was in 2019, that the room was packed, that, that picture all the way to the back folding chair. So thank you and hats off to you and about Rotary. Okay, um, Dr. Natiri, um, we have been trying to work behind the scenes to open the slideshow. You sent it to Fulbright Association and to me, but it's on a protected server at Wayne State and I don't have permission to open it. So you know what I think we should do um, we have some time left, Dr. Natiri. I realized this was not part of the plan, but if you could just talk to us, and we, we probably, you know, unless we probably won't be able to open your PowerPoint show, but just tell us, you know, in a couple of minutes what you wanted to share, and we'll just we'll learn from each other that way through old-fashioned. Well, guess what? Guess what? I think my husband is here, and ah, he's good. a technician, right? And so he's going to um, figure out what I am doing wrong. So my okay. my. Yeah, right there, so. Well, then uh, while you're doing that, your husband is helping you. And sometimes we turn to our spouses, <laughs> partners, husbands, wives. Sometimes we turn to our grandchildren to help us in moments like this. Um, go ahead. And what I'm going to do while we're waiting, I'm going to invite the audience to, again, go to the Q&A and pose a question to one or more of our um, panelists. We have a question in the Q&A now. It's from Beverly, well, Dr. Terry, while you're doing that, and I'm glad Dr. McDaniel is still able to be with us. We have a question from Beverly Lindsay, which I will read. And this is to everyone on the panel. I'm gonna just challenge every one of our panelists to talk about this. Here's what Beverly Lindsay asked. Depending upon your Fulbright type, did you not have an IRB, an Institutional Review Board, or similar clearance to undertake your work for example, in the USA, Beverly Lindsay writes, I had a Ford Foundation doctoral dissertation work. I had clearance in the Kenyan Ministry of Education, the College of Education, UMass Amherst. Process of IRBs and ethical clearances are much more extensive now and so forth. So I would ask the panelists and especially Dr. McDaniel, if you would start us off with that, are, can we rely on IRBs at our different institutions in the US to prepare us to be good visiting ethical scholars abroad? Do you have some thoughts about that? And then I turn to our other panelists too. Uh, Jim, that's an, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think what I would say is that, and I've sat on an IRB and an ethics, several ethics committees, IRBs are very specific to the research that's done. Uh, and they're usually done mainly by scholars. Uh, senior specs, for example, cannot engage in research. And that was true of my last three uh, Fulbrights. It's, it's, an, it's an important dimension. I would encourage anyone, if they're going to be doing research, I frankly would say, if it's not going to be approved by the IRB, perhaps rethink it because it would be difficult to be published. It would be difficult to further share it. But I guess I would also say that that's not the same as coming back to a country where you're doing a presentation on your entire experience. And hopefully that experience is not just the IRB and those dimensions that were contained under that particular review. So again, an institutional review board is, uh, was put in place back in the late, uh, in the early um, 1990s, late 1880s, with specific emphasis on how we treat the subjects that we engage in when we're doing institutional research. So I'll stop there and see what anyone else wants to say. Important to have, and thank you for the question. Okay, and I too served on a campus IRB, even though I'm a historian by training and typically all the people we study, sadly are long dead. And so we, we don't harm them, um, they're, they're dead, but their reputations are important and so forth. Um, Dr. Vienna Alvarez, any, any comments about that, about the ethical um, yes. um, scholar? Um, yes, it is so important. So some institutions are big enough to have IRBs, whereas other institu institutions like myself are not big enough to have a really on-campus IRB. So I would recommend for others to reach out to certain established IRBs at bigger institutions to use as their model. If you do not have an IRB, I I'm talking about the rules and all that. Pretty much 
we have about 2000 over 2000 students we really do not have any enough faculty to be able to support an IRB for our campus but we can go to our system campus in Columbia University of South Carolina to then assist us with that Thank you. Uh, Dr. Corbett, you're at Portland State. That's a big urban university of 25,000 students. Any, any thoughts about this question of the ethical scholar and institutional controls? Well, I'm having a little problem starting the video, but I can certainly talk. And I was struck by the comments here because when I was a boy, in graduate school, we were taught to be ethical and we didn't need to have a panel or overview to uh, provide some kind of feedback for us. So if one doesn't have an innate sense of what is an appropriate way to behave in rural communities with vulnerable populations in difficult situations, then I guess IRBs are an important piece of the academic framework. But if you grew up as a good scholar, you ought to have a sense of what is appropriate and have a sense of when you begin to tiptoe to the boundaries of difficult situations, not only for yourself, but for others. And I've had occasion to interview people who have admitted to me that they, they've committed murder. And that never goes into a text because all I have is their statement. And it's not my involvement to create problems for them. So I appreciate the, the focus on the IRB, but I think the broader question is the question of, have you learned to be ethical in an appropriate form so that you do not need somebody standing over your shoulder? You've got that voice whispering in your ear. That would be my perspective on that. Okay, thanks, Dr. Corbett. I want to give Jeff Kelly Lowenstein and if Ukani Sele is on with us a chance to tackle this one. And then we'll go back to Dr. Natiri and see if we can hear her presentation. Um, Jeff, the, the, what thoughts about this? As a journalist, just preface this. This is a, a common issue in journalism. I think of what Dr. McDaniel was teaching us that, that she drew on the work of Robert Coles. And it's been a while, Dr. McDaniel, since I looked at polls, but wasn't he thinking about that Great Depression? Wasn't it Let Us Now Face, Praise Famous Men, the Walker Evans photographs? Is that right? Okay, so this is a work of, of uh, particip or journalism, um, participatory. Jeff, any thoughts about that? Yes, and uh, thank you for uh, bringing us into the conversation to my colleagues for their thoughtful input, and I know Dr. McDaniel was leading us in this area as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Vienna Alvarez in terms of the thought of kind of community engagement. And so what I would, what I would suggest, this is a very big issue in journalism, uh, both within the United States and internationally um, at the Center for Collaborative Investigative Journalism, where we bring together data scientists, investigative reporters, and visual storytellers to carry out ongoing investigation in the key global issues. It, it's something we talk a, about a lot about how are we entering communities? How are we learning? Are we, are we uh, being humble? Are we being open? And I think uh, in terms of the theme of the, of the session and, and, and kind of what you can pick up from, from all of the panelists, I'm sure many of the other attendees, is that I think that it's a matter of encouraging us to think about Fulbright, not only in terms of the specific year, but in terms of building an ongoing and respectful relationship with the community to which we're privileged to go to, and then to which we're able to return. But then hopefully there can be that ongoing and gradually deeper and more trusting exchange. And I do think that uh, Dr. McDaniel made an important point referring to Dr. Coles 
uh, when she talked about the importance of really being specific about the limits of what we know and what we don't know. And so, for example, when, when you go to a specific community that you don't uh, make overly general statements um, about what this is about the community or the culture or the history and so on, but really uh, kind of being being candid and transparent about the, the limits of that. Um, and I guess just the last thing I'd say is that I thought Dr. Vienna Alvarez's points about the kind of information ecosystem uh, that exists and, and, and a lot of the misinformation that is, that is consciously uh, shared by people who want to discredit those who are trying to actually get accurate and probing work out. I think that's really important. And I think that we as, as the members of the Fulbright community have a very uh, important opportunity and platform uh, to be able to try and uh, contribute meaningfully to that. So thank you for asking my opinion. And th those are my thoughts. Thank you. Microphone back on and my, my camera. I'm just going to read a it's more of a comment for um, Jeff in, um, it's in the Q and A, it's from Norma Green. I just wanna read it because I, I, I think I wanna share this with everybody. Quote from Norma Green. I tuned in to see my former colleague, Jeff, and wasn't surprised to hear about his ongoing friendship with a South African colleague, but I think he is modest about ongoing friendships he made on his Fulbrights in Chile and New Zealand. His open heart and mind have had a global reach. All these have been wonderful presentations that are thought provoking, and what this organization is all about, even after 75 years. So thank you to Norman Green. Jeff, I see you're blushing, but um, <laughs> you deserve the praise here. And at this point, we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to hear from Dr. Daphne Natiri. And what I um, would like to let her know is that if, if she can't, if the technology doesn't work, her husband can't, can't make push the right button, it's OK. You could still talk to us, Dr. Natiri, and then we could come back and record um, separately a presentation and fit into, into the session. So we're, we're gonna get your slides and PowerPoint, even if it's not now. So Dr. Natiri, if you would turn on your microphone and your camera and talk to us, we would be delighted to listen. There you are. I'm delighted to speak to you. I am a little bit frustrated right now because I, I, I can't have, I don't know what happened. I mean, I just sent it, again to um, the Full Bread Association, but um, the, 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 my, um, my topic, the paradox of scant, taking the proactive leap as a full in, um, it should have ended up with in French speaking countries. Um, I spent um, 2015 in um, University of Ouagadougou, a French speaking country. It's a landlocked country that's surrounded by six other countries. And with me was another full scholar and um, um, two other um, Fulbright students. One was a medical student and the other one was a, a, a graduate doctoral student in um, water resources. I say that because in the end, I, I wanna mention something about what we're just talking about because I never thought I belonged to this panel on ethics and implications. But now after listening to some of the speakers, I can see that I really do really belong because what I'm going on to about the title of my talk addresses what I reimagine in terms of Africa and uh, um, avoiding negative stereotypes. And one of the speakers addressed some of that in terms of the right pictures, the right words. And uh, these things are characteristic uh, in the description of African locations and assignment. As a native of the soil, I am a native of Sierra Leone and I've worked in other African universities of higher learning, namely the University of Djibouti, which is also a French speaking country, the teacher's school in Somalia, and at the UNESCO Breda office, I find out that there are definitely cultural differences because you're going to third world countries and you expect some cultural differences. But there are, there's enough adaptation you can um, um, you know, adjust to the adjustment to this and the, and the way the people embrace you, the way they love, they look forward to learning more about the, Brit the English culture. I say British because I'm from Sierra Leone, everything is British, but uh, I'm talking about the English culture and um, the enthusiastic response, the warm embrace the idea of um, trying as hard as possible to speak French is, is indescribable. Um, Kaim and some of you reminds us of the, in the book, Mistake in Africa. They say that many people from the West go to Africa and looking for the real Africa. I was in Ouagadougou. Ouagadougou, the, the roads are not macadamized, but there's a chance for us to, it's, it's easy transportation because there are not too many cars, everybody's on bikes and motorcycles. And some of my pictures would have shown some of that, but I miss that. Another thing about um, these stereotypes 
is the fact that um, there's a Nigerian writer, Chimamanda Adichie, the notable writer who said, um, there is something called a single story. And what about the, the, thing, the thing wrong with a single story is that it is not complete. The dangers of a single story, I mean, which is always um, uh, incomplete because I only tell you one side, I don't tell you the other. So I had an ad that started my presentation that says, Africans do not look alike. African is not a country. Africa is not a language. Africans do not need to be saved. Africa existed before colonialism. Africa is not a land filled with diseases. So there's one thing I'd like for people to take away from here, and I think we've had all global experiences from East, West, North, and South, is the fact that my hope uh, with this was to correct dis distortions. I am from the land, uh, prejudices and stereotypes, and uh, I, I was hoping, I don't know why I'm doing that, because I think all of you have created the kind of legitimacy I'm talking about for the continent with um, the, um, all the evolving processes of development that we witness today and the really rapid pace of social change on the continent. So uh, a few things about what I did in, uh, in, in, in at the University of Ouagadougou. I had a load, a teaching load. I was there to teach. I was teaching in the Department of um, African American and World Cultures. Uh, um, and um, a couple of things, um, in a French speaking country, I don't know how it is elsewhere, but they gave me a beautiful three bedroom house uh, in the center of the city that was close to the university. And that was a, a, a really wonderful thing, provided safety and security and we're very close to members of the embassy. Um, transportation, as I said, was, you know, there are always bikes and motorcycles. And uh, I had a taxi driver that took me around. The department was short staff, so it's, it's, uh, my, I was asked to teach four classes, but at the end I, I taught four cl five classes. What was I teaching? I, I had two areas. One was to teach African-American lit, and the second part was gender. In my African-American lit class, uh, what I remember, since I don't have too much time, is the fact that um, these students were just so anxious and spoke, I mean, I, I was surprised that the level of English that they had. And one of the things I did uh, to get them, because my class size was sometimes over 400, 400 students, and uh, we did it auditorium style. And um, I did a play, which they, I always remember because the students just gravitated towards it. As big as that auditorium was, we did um, a Lorraine Hansberry, uh, A Reason in the Sun. Um, the message, I don't think they completely understood the message because uh, I guess we don't have that kind of issues that they have here in, in, in Africa. But it, it did ring a bell to many people. They enjoyed the play, they enjoyed um, you know, working on it. My pedagogy in, in teaching writing, because uh, we had to help, I had a speaker speak before in terms of teachers are not trained to teach or are not trained to teach specific kind of skills, particularly when it comes to writing. And I found that it was the same case too. Um, so I had a, uh, uh, they asked to write, me to write, to help students with writing and thinking as a researcher, writing and thinking as um, uh, critical thinking skills. We did research skills, for example, citations, in-text citations and citations at the end of a paper. We didn't do that with undergraduate students, but I spent quite a bit of time doing that with um, the graduate students. Um, uh, in the graduate students, we spent time talking about uh, um, gender. Um, I, I spent some time talking about cross-cultural study of women, women colonialism and development, uh, because that is a, an, an issue in the history courses, but we brought that into English too. Um, gender stratification, women and religion in, uh, in Ouagadou, in Burkina Faso, there was 60% English and um, Muslim, and for, I think 35% um, Christian and 5% other. Uh, so we looked at women and religion, we looked at some very interesting issues uh, as uh, after womanism, feminism, and then from feminism we went to what was designed to address the needs of black women, because black women have carved a space for them within, it's a sister to feminism or a, a derivation of feminism, but we've um, um, developed this concept, several theories have come out of it. We have African feminism, we have black feminism, we have womanism, we have um, Africana womanism. I am part and parcel of the Africana womanism. So that was one area where I put a lot of emphasis in terms of helping students um, uh, work with that. So African, Africana womanism is, um, it, it just presents an intensive critical analysis of uh, the oppression of racism, classism and sexism that in intersect uh, the pursuit of self-definition. So self-definition is very important. And I, uh, students were very interested in it. In fact, they were planning to have a, a, they had a conference in Zimbabwe and we were planning to have a conference and that whole idea of African womanism that was um, 
constructed or designed or um, uh, created uh, by Klenoga Hotsit Williams at the University of Missouri. Um, so that was um, areas of, um, in the, I even had a doctoral student who was pursuing that. We even touched on female circumcision because uh, that still permeates the culture and we had to look at some of that and what we were gonna do about it. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in terms of um, uh, uh, <clears throat> curriculum development because uh, as we said, um, this, the, the curriculum is based and directly follows the French system. And so, but they were very anxious to include, and they do have some of African American um, literature in their in their collect in the part of their inventory. But they wanted me to add a, a few more. I'm quickly going to run through some of the other things quickly because there's one um, serious part I'm looking at the time. Um, we look at faculty support. One good thing that I thought I was able to do was to work with the faculty in terms of translations and editing. Uh, I was able to get um, uh, Professor Porter, who wrote on Nathaniel Hayton. Um, getting his uh, publication ready um, for a journal in the United States. So I was very proud of that. We worked closely with the, uh, with the ambassador also who had some projects for uh, schools. And so we went to schools and, and promoted, um, you know, American education, American, gave them ideas of what's happening in America. Um, there's also the Fulbright Selection Committee. You know, we have people coming from here. So that was a big thing. It took about a, a couple of weeks of my time going through and sieving through filtering applications for, for people, professionals and uh, academics who wanted to come to the United States. One of the biggest um, projects that I think uh, resulted from, and talking about implications and kind of follow up that comes from this was something that we, uh, I, we was initiated in um, Ouagadougou. And it's so sad that I can't I can look at it, but maybe I can, I can uh, share my screen on that one. It's uh, something we call Pool for Progress, Pool for Progress. It was an NGO, uh, a nonprofit that was created uh, by a young man called Sami Benjamil, who was part of our team uh, in Ouagadougou. And we all came together. And the first project we did was a soap project. How to, they do, they do make soap in Ouagadougou in different ways, but um, uh, Sami invited people, make it a big event, invited some people from Texas. He was from Texas. And they came in to help us refine the process of um, making soap. That was really big. Um, and then from there, there was a collapse breach. And we picked that up also as a project. So Pool for Progress did a couple of those things. And it's amazing that today, the board of Pool for Progress has been expanded. And we now have several other projects that have come in to help, I mean, to help the community. Um, the community is um, really diverse. I think uh, we had uh, even a response to COVID. They have a way to, um, they've been able to manufacture some um, hand sanitizers through this from um, donations that are coming from um, United States. They were able to send some bicycles to the kids um, in Ouagadougou. They have bicycles for, for kids there. We have community health clubs for hygiene. Since my research area was adult literacy, I spent quite a bit of time working with women entrepreneurs in terms of language of commerce to get them to understand how to negotiate small loans with a bank. They have something that goes around them that's called some kind of osusu, that where they have everybody contributes and, and then they have a lump sum of money. But the bank- so, Dr. Natiri, this is James here. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're running a little late. Could you wrap okay, so up gonna, in the next gonna, minute or so? Thank yes, you. Yes, we'll wrap it up. So, Thank you so um, much. Yeah, yeah, so the pull for progress, uh, uh, it's my fault that I, you know, I, mean, I, I cannot mess up. I, I don't know I'm gonna sleep tonight, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. So um, the language of commerce was very important and we actually designated some, um, you know, some classrooms where we were able to do some of this stuff. And I am still, in, I'm in touch with a couple of them. I'm still in touch with my doctoral student who also um, managed to, um, uh, Nadine Wagogo, who was able to um, finish her, um, uh, her dissertation uh, on, on, on gender. So. With that, I think, um, I, I hope that um, at least I shared something. Uh, I like to share something about French speaking countries because in the United States, we all go to Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, and uh, we don't spend as much time with the French speaking countries because most of them go to France, they don't come here. So I, I spend my time you know, helping out with French speaking countries because I think we just need you know, a little bit more of that um, pulling, reaching out to them and bringing them in here. So. I'll stop for now. Thank you so much for your patience and thanks for giving me an, an op other opportunity, even though I missed the first one. I, I really appreciate that. 
Oh, it was worth it to hear you, Dr. Nguyen. It was wonderful. Thank you. And I, I believe, is, if, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't five of the six largest French-speaking cities in the world in Africa? Which one is that? Uh, five of them, yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, we'll do that. yeah, it's, yes. it's, um, yeah, it's, yes. uh, yeah. Well, yes. Dakar, Sen Dakar, Senegal is one of the, it's a big one. Dakar, yes. Senegal is one. Bigger than and, Montreal, yes. Yeah, right. Anyway, what a wonderful session. I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, we, we had people from Mexico, from North America. We had people from um, Africa. Um, what a great session. So thank you, panelists. We have run late. And, and I know that the Fulbright Association staff has been working hard for three days. This is the last panel on our three-day conference. We ought to... Give them i'm just going to hold my hands up and, and thank our our presenters and thank the fulbright association staff for putting on such a wonderful conference so um i think you have contact information for our presenters i encourage you to follow up email them uh, with questions comments observations but for now we're going to say in hungarian in english goodbye and what other language Good thank you Au revoir. Au revoir. yes goodbye Okay. Oh my gosh, Lee. Adios. Adios.